Bali. Uh, we will continue with Maria Frappoli's uh, presentation of her book. And this afternoon, uh, she will present he, her views about expressivism and expressivism related to the notion of truth. And Vasilis Sompandis will comment uh, her presentation. So, uh, if you have any questions uh, after the presentation, please turn on the button in front of you before uh, doing the questions, making the questions. Okay? Thank you very much, Maria. Okay. <laughs> Been here again, and now I would like to, to present you or to explain to you the main line of the philosophy that I, I assume in order to uh, offer in my account. Of so, uh, all my, my position is expressivism, and in fact, uh, so the, the, the main line. Of expressivism, or the kind of expressivism that I endorse, uh, has been published in a paper uh, that I wrote with a colleague. Uh, and the paper is called Minimal Expressivism. Minimal in the sense that I'm going to, to explain now. Uh, with the term expressivism, it happens exactly the same as uh, happens with uh, other terms like uh, pragmatism, or naturalism, or representationalism, or realism. And uh, the, the, the situation is that the terms, the, this ter this, all these terms, mean different things in different mouth, mouths. So I'm going to, uh, to make it explicit, which are the postulates that I attach to my theory of truth. So here is the plan of the talk. I'm insisting in that my position is an empirical position, is an empirical hypothesis. This is why I have uh, labeled the first part of my talk, some facts of the matter. And the idea is that I'm going to focus on some features of terms in English or in Spanish or in Portuguese and try to explain uh, these features in an empirical uh, way. So I'm not uh, inventing uh, the, the, this feature, this uh, pro uh, uh, the properties, but uh, trying to identify the properties uh, they have in the use that we make of them. So, uh, second, I, I will define what I mean by expressive meaning, what mm -hmm. it is for me to have expressive meaning, so uh, for, what it is uh, for, a, for a term to have expressive meaning. And uh, this is, but uh, I'm not going to talk about the Friedrich argument today because uh, it's too long, but the idea, the general idea is the following. So against expressive meaning, against, mm -hmm. against some kind of expressive meaning, People have uh, addressed a well-known argument, which is uh, called the frege gitch argument. So I'm going to review the frege gitch argument. I, I'm going to do it tomorrow morning and explain that the frege gitch argument uh, doesn't touch my kind of expressivism. So I, th I think that the frege gitch argument is uh, unwarranted unless one adds to it some claims, 
for which we don't have any justification. But in any case, in any of its versions, mm -hmm. the frege Gitche argument doesn't touch my kind of expressivism and the conclusion. So today I'm going to talk about some facts of the matter and what is expre expressive meaning. A Freyan theme. So I'm, I consider Frege to have an expressivist interpretation of the meaning of truth. He says, logic has a closer affinity with ethics, the property good has a significance for the latter, analogous to that which the, pro the property true has for the former. Uh, so in some sense, no, no, what, what I mean is that uh, I, I'm going to explain uh, this, uh, the, the, I mean, I'm going to explain this uh, Freudian intuition, but uh, this uh, quotation is here because I want to, to, uh, to draw the links between the classical uh, accounts of good, which are expressivist in the 20th century, and an expressivist account of truth. So the idea is that in the same sense in which we can. So there are some reasons to think that the way in which the term good works is similar to the way in which the word true works. And I consider it a Freudian theme, so this connection. Okay? So two theses, two empirical theses. <coughs> the first one. Some perfectly meaningful linguistic structure don't represent aspects of the world. And nevertheless, this semantic fact doesn't defy our dearest realist and cognitivist intuitions. In particular, truth, truth terms, doesn't truth terms don't correspond uh, to any identifiable ingredients of the state of affairs. And in general, many other higher order concepts, good, known, all, are like truth, Cambridge properties too. This is a joke. Cambridge property is a property that doesn't correspond to any feature of a state of, uh, of affairs. So the idea, the basic idea is, in natural languages, this is why it's an empirical, I'm proposing an empirical hypothesis. In natural languages, there are perfectly meaningful terms whose function is not to represent any feature of the state of affairs. Truth is one of these notions, but also knowledge or all or, mm, I don't know, exist or good, etc. In general, higher order concepts don't represent aspects of the state of affairs. Uh, the distinction I want to, to draw is one between first order concepts and higher order concepts in the following way. Natural languages include expressions of a predicative nature that admit predicables as arguments. So in our, in our natural languages, we have predicables, so or, expre or, or predicative expressions that have objects as the arguments, but also we have some other predicative expressions whose arguments are Predicables. <coughs> These expressions, the expressions uh, that have other predicables as arguments, are higher order predicables and express higher order concepts. A proper subset, those predicables whose arguments are, have to be zero adic, for instance, sentences and on the non linguistic side, propositions. So here I'm not, go I'm not being fragile. So, because Frege put sentences and proposition on the on the on the same side as uh, it, uh, he classified names and objects, I'm not doing that. I'm saying that propositions can be understood as zero-adic concepts, concepts that don't have any 
argument place. This is the third person uh, intuition. So some, uh, I'm going to offer some examples. I can say everybody knows that the Korean team won the World uh, Championship of the League of Legends. My son told me. I don't have any idea about the League of Legends. But uh, if if I say, so you can see here that uh, knows is an expression, is an expression of a predicative nature. It has a, an argument place, but this argument uh, place has to be filled with a combination of concepts. So it, I can say it's good that finally the Central European Bank has decided not to continue with its former politics of austerity. If I say good in this sense, so if you look at this const uh, construction, li linguistic construction, you can see that it is good that it's a predicative expression, it's a predicative expression whose um, argument has to be a combination of concepts. Oh, I can say it is true that human beings evolved from previous living forms by natural selection. If I say that, I have this construction, so I have it is true that, which is a sort of predicative expression, whose argument is a combination of concepts. So, as an empirical thesis, again, as an empirical thesis, I'm saying that certain terms work in natural languages as higher order expressions, higher order in the sense that they argument, their argument, uh, the arguments are not singular terms, but either, com uh, either predicative expressions or complete sentences. So my first thesis, I take my position to be a series a series of truisms. So my first semantic thesis, T1. <coughs> Some predicative expressions require predicative or sentential arguments. Alternative, uh, alternatively, some concepts express properties, modifications, or operations on other concepts or conceptual content. This is the first thesis. And I call thesis one, Semantic hierarchism, which means that we have concepts of different levels in natural languages. This is why I have called this thesis semantic hierarchism. Sometimes grammar is not a good guide into the way in which our concepts work. Not always is a good uh, guide as play also so. Then uh, the point is that the same thing that we have said by using these notions and no, sorry, this concept, no good and true, in a position in which they, are, they were operators, the same things can be said using construction in which these notions apparently are ordinary predicates. Korean success in the championship of the League of Legends is well known. I haven't, with this uh, sentence, I'm not saying anything different from the, uh, the content I have uh, uh, put forward in my former example. Or the end of austerity, uh, of austerity politics in Europe is good, or the evolution theory is true. So if we look at this kind of construction, sometimes we can't distinguish between higher order predicates and first order predicates. My intuition is that even though higher order predicates can occur in, construction, uh, in constructions in which they are uh, indistinguishable from first order concepts, these predicates can also be put in a position in which they work as operators. So everything that I can see, 
as I can, I can say, using is good in this position can be said by using the correspondent uh, operator, it is good that. The same with true and the same with known, for instance. So, again, let's go uh, back again to Frege. This is a, a quotation of the Grishrift, which I take to be a pragmatist uh, piece of work. Now, I call the part of the content that is the same in both the conceptual content, he says. Only this has a significance for our symbolic language. We need, therefore, make no distinction between propositions that have the same conceptual content. Uh, uh, what I want to stress is that in this, uh, the, the same content is being put forward by using these constructions in which higher order concepts appear as if they were first order, or in this construction. So there is no difference. Okay? So, uh, I said, I have said that uh, I take my position to be an empirical uh, position, and this is why I, I, I wanted to argue that even though somebody can uh, might argue that uh, there is some kind of knowledge which is not propositional, I don't know, direct knowledge or knowledge by acquaintance or whatever, and in the same sense in which uh, some instances of good might appear, might occur, as if, if uh, the, the notion were first order, and also there are some cases in which we say a true friend, uh, and somebody might think, I don't think so, but somebody, somebody might think that in this kind of construction, uh, truth is not higher order, okay? I, I mean, I'm not uh, rejecting this. What I want to stress is that all these, no, uh, all these notions have instances in which they are genuinely higher order. So they have a concept as the argument. So my semantic hierarchism is an empirical position, an empirical thesis. There are, in natural languages, notions that work this way, okay? Uh, as I see it, again, a, a new uh, uh, hypothesis, also an, a, a, an empirical hypothesis. There is, I want to propose that there is a principal distinction in the way in which higher order uh, concepts work in contrast with the way in which uh, first order concepts work. I think there are a principal distinction. Even though sometimes, from a syntactic point of view, we can say the same by the use of, um, of, uh, of terms which, which seems to be first order. Okay? First order concepts are ingredients of what is said. Uh, for instance, if Victoria said, I don't like Mondays, here there are a propositional content, which is Victoria doesn't like Mondays, and we can think that part of this content, of this propositional content, uh, part of this propositional content are, or is composed of first order concepts. But, uh, as I see it, the function of higher order concepts only begins when we have complete, proposition, uh, complete propositional content at our disposal. This is why I think that there is a principal distinction in the way in which they work. 
Again, a quotation from Frege. With a few sounds and combination of sounds, language is capable of expressing a huge number of thoughts, and in particular, thoughts which have not hitherto uh, been grasped or expressed by any man. How can it achieve so much by virtue of the fact that thoughts have parts out of which they are built up? This idea of the propositional content building blocks, so this idea is, is in Frege, in some uh, uh, works by Frege, the idea that we build up propositional content out of concepts, or concepts and other things. This idea is also present in Recanati and in many other But uh, the, the, the intuition is very simple, and I will explain it uh, better in a while. Uh, so, the idea is, I have said, <clears throat> there is a principal distinction between higher order concepts and first order concepts. And the principal distinction can be, uh, can be seen in the following fact. Whereas first order concepts can be understood as the building blocks of propositional content, higher order concepts don't work as building blocks. So they begin their job once the, the building blocks have been put together to form propositional content. Okay? This is the semantic intuition that I want to put forward today. But and the idea of the building blocks is a constant in the philosophy of language of, of the 20th century. The idea that uh, propositions are composed of parts, which are concepts. So, again, functional propositions, by contrast, are not building blocks. So, some terms, some concepts, don't affect the truth conditional core of the speech act in which they occur. So, some concepts don't affect the propositional core of the argument in the sense in which building blocks do. Okay? And uh, what I'm saying is in agreement with some contemporary theories of linguistic meaning. Linguists explain that adverbial adjuncts, discourse markers, and some other auxiliary expressions are used to qualify, restrict, or modulate a sentence interpretation. So the sentence interpretation is a proposition and is, let's say, built up out of building blocks. But once we have these building blocks put together and we have a complete propositional content, then we still have some other expressions in language which have the job of indicating how we should interpret or how we should restrict or how we, uh, we should take or understand, or whatever, the propositional contents that are previous, that we, we, we already uh, have available. <coughs> so, example, expressions such as on purpose, honestly, therefore, indeed, etc., are examples of meaningful expressions. The point here is meaningful expressions that don't behave as propositions building blocks. The idea is if you have, uh, so I'm going to insist on in something that I said yesterday. If you have a representational theory of meaning, this implies, this representational theory of meaning implies that all terms work in the same way. They represent 
components of propositions, components of the propositional content of the sentence in which they occur. What I'm saying is that this view of language is false, not because I want to say it, but because linguists say it and because we can see it if we pay attention to the way in which some of our expressions work. Okay? So, there are, the point is, there are expressions, meaningful expressions in natural languages whose function is not to behave as a building block, but something else. Again, temporal, locative, alessic, and epistemic locutions help to fill the indexes, possible worlds, places, and time required to assign truth values to content. So we need to have content, but we also need to have some other kind of expression that help to fill the gap which are opened by the indexes that uh, allow us an interpretation or an evaluation of the content. So, possibly tomorrow and everywhere are some examples. And here, my second theoretical uh, hypothesis, or my, my, my second thesis, T2. There are several ways in which an expression can be meaningful. Alternatively, there are several ways in which an expression can affect the overall conceptual and non-conceptual meaning of the act in which it is put to work. And I call this thesis semantic pluralism. So we have now two theoretical uh, hypotheses, which are semantic hierarchism and semantic pluralism. Examples of people who have defended semantic pluralism, for instance, Austin, we know. So moreover, the verbs which seem on grounds of voc vocabulary to be specially performative verbs serve the special purpose of making explicit uh, what precise action it is that is being performed by the issuing of the, uh, of the atom. So Austin made room for expressions who work in a different way, who were not representational in meaning. And also, okay, Blakemore is a linguist, is, is a linguist uh, uh, and uh, she defends that these kind of expressions, after all, and but, are not building blocks, that they, uh, they do not encode a constituent of a conceptual representation, but guide the comprehension process so that the hearer ends up with a conceptual representation. So there are some expressions that represent or encode a constituent of the conceptual representation, but there are some, some other expressions, for instance, therefore, or but, that don't encode this kind of ingredient. <clears throat> so, what is expressive meaning? Okay, the meaning of some, of some terms can be visualized as the building blocks of the thoughts expressed by the sentences in which they occur, and the meaning of some others cannot. The latter term, this, these terms that don't encode building blocks, proposition building block, possess what they call expressive meaning. Expressive meaning. Expressive meaning, in the sense in which the label is used here, and hopefully the sense in which the label is slowly beginning to be standard in the literature, only involves the two following claims. Uh, sorry, only involves the following claim, that the semantic contribution of the term, the semantic contribution of the term concern is not an ingredient of what is said. And here, again, a quotation by Frege, talking about truth. One might be tempted to regard the relation uh, of the thought to the truth, not as that of sense to meaning, 
but rather as that of subject to predicate. One can indeed say the thought that five is a prime number is true, but closer examination shows that nothing more has been said than in the simple sentence, five is a prime number. The truth claim arises in each case from the form of the assertoric sentence. What Frege is saying here is that it's true, uh, it's true, doesn't work here as a genuine predicate in the sense that uh, it is not encoding a new conceptual component besides the conceptual component that are, that are encoded in the, sub, in the sentences subject. Again, not just uh, Frege, other uh, classical philosophers of, of uh, language have accepted that some terms don't encode building blocks, don't encode components of what is said. For instance, Russell. This is the principle of the theory of the noting I wish to advocate, that the noting phrases never have any meaning in themselves. The evidence for, for the above theory is derived from the difficulties which seem unavoidable if we regard the noting phrases as standing for genuine constituents of the propositions in whose verbal expressions they occur. So what Russell thought was that uh, the noting phrases um, uh, description, uh, definite description, of, but also indefinite description, don't correspond to any identifiable component of what is said. <coughs> and also Recanati, but I'm not going to read this, uh, uh, this uh, quotation. What I'm going to, to to explain is that a sentence is truth condition, the notion of truth condition is ambiguous between two different senses. There is a sense in which a truth condition and a sentence is truth conditions are the, or is the complex information required to determine an utterance's truth value that includes a content, a virtual, a contextually built up, and the circumstances of evaluation which is the Austinian proposition, let's say. But a sentence is truth condition can be, can also be whatever determines the state of affairs that we have to compare with the circumstances of evaluation in order to determine the truth value of uh, what we are saying. This is the lecture in the sense of recognition. So the notion of truth condition is thus ambiguous between the evaluable semantic core of an utterance, the Aristotelian proposition or lecton, and this core, together with the auxiliary information required to effectively compute its truth value. So, look at this kind of example. What I'm saying is that there is something that there is some part of the content that these three sentences share. They share the lecton. They share the proposition that John married Mary. But we can have just the proposition, the truth condition, the lecton, and we can we can have the lecton together with uh, together with some expressions that don't contribute a, a new component to the lecton, but that indicate the circumstances of evaluation. So the way in which expressions, uh, temporal expressions such as 10 years ago, the way in which these kind of expressions work is different from the way in which the expressions that are represented in the lecture, in the lecture do. Again, Victoria believes that John married Mary. John married <coughs> Mary is the same lecture here again but is put in a context in whose uh, circumstances of, of evaluation has been indicated by a prefix uh, uh, which uh, don't possess representational meaning. Okay? So, these three examples 
share the lecture, but not necessarily the truth value. Not necessarily the truth value. So the intuition is there is some kind of terms that are used to build up a propositional, a basic propositional uh, content, but also we have some other kind of terms that help to understand the kind of speech act that we are performing by indicating, for instance, where uh, or yeah, where uh, should we evaluate the lecton that has been put forward. And in this sense, these uh, 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 expressions indicate the circumstances of evaluation of the same lecton. So here, my third theoretical hypothesis, T3, functions of propositions, I take no, true, good, all these expressions, I take them to be functions of propositions because they are higher order concepts. Functions of propositions intervene in the Austinian proposition, indicating part of the circumstances in which the lecton has to be evaluated. Nevertheless, they don't affect the lecton, which is the argument. Okay? And I call T3 semantic expressivism. What I'm saying is that, to put it in a nutshell, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is that higher order concepts don't contribute the overall meaning of a speech act with a new conceptual component, but with some other information that helps the audience to understand what is being doing by the use of the sentence. Okay. So, minimal expressivism is my position. My position is, uh, I call my position minimal expressivism, expressivism, and minimal expressivism is semantic hierarchism plus semantic pluralism plus semantic expressivism. This is minimal expressivism. What I'm trying to convey is that the meaning of truth is expressivist in this sense, in the sense of this general theory of expressivism. I'm not making any other hypothesis about the way in which first order concepts work. You can be representationalist about first order concepts. I don't, I mean, I don't care. It's okay. It's compatible with my position. What I'm just trying to convince you is that from an empirical point of view, we can see that many of our terms don't work, in fact, don't work by representing a new component of the state of affairs or by contribute, in, contributing a new concept to the proposition um, uh, conveyed or expressed. Okay? Uh, Against expressivism, I have said that uh, the, the term expressivism means many different things, and there, there have been many, author, uh, many authors who have uh, shown their opposition to this kind of approach to meaning. For instance, uh, Kühne is one of them, and he says the truth operator, so he's criticizing, he's directly criticizing Frege, and he says, the truth operator does have a sense, but Frege claims this sense somehow annihilates itself. The word true has a sense that contributes nothing to the sense, to the whole sentences in which it occurs, uh, it occurs as a predicate. So it's a direct quotation from Frege. And Kühne says, if Frege's contention were correct, then one cannot understand any declarative sentence whatsoever without grasping the mysteriously self-effacing sense of truth, or rather of it's true that. So, Kühne's idea, uh, idea is that if Frege were right, then the effect of this notion of truth would be 
annihilate, uh, annihilating the propositional content to which it applies. This is why I have called this kind of position uh, semantic nihilism. Some other people uh, uh, oppose, it, uh, oppose uh, this conception of expressivism uh, from the non-cognitivist uh, files or sides. Expressivism, some people say, is not my kind of expressivism, but uh, some people defend that expressivism. Uh, uh, the definition is the, the following. A domain D of discourse is expressive just in case an account of what speakers do in a certain sentence is in D, doesn't view speakers as being directed towards as being directed towards relation of representation between the inventor state and reality, but rather views uh, speakers as expressing a state of mind where these states of mind are not a representational or true apt, apt state. The point here is the combination of representational with truth apt state. A generalized idea uh, about expressivism is that when one, say, when one says that a, a, a sentence has an expressive use, one is rejecting that the, that the sentence has truth conditions. So this is a, the, the, the generalized uh, criticism. But as I see it, Minimal expressivism is neither nihilism nor non-cognitivism. I don't accept this uh, uh, characterization of what uh, it is to be an expressivist. And the point is that a function semantic value cannot be identified with a propositional component in the lexicon. doesn't mean that the function concerned doesn't possess any semantic value. What I'm saying is that some expressions don't contribute a new component. But it doesn't mean that because they don't contribute a component, they don't have a semantic value. And again, that a function semantic value cannot be identified with a propositional component of the lecton doesn't mean that the speech act in which it is involved, doesn't have a proposition at the semantic content. So that we, in a speech act, use terms with expressive meaning, doesn't imply that the speech act as a whole doesn't put forward a propositional content with truth conditions. Okay? In fact, the characterization given here of expressions such as good, truth, and knowledge as function of propositions settles the issue of the truth aptness by definition. Are they truth apt? The answer is, of course they are, because they are functions of words, functions of propositions. Propositions are the arguments, and propositions are the entities capable of capable of, bear, of uh, bearing uh, truth and falseness, okay? Truth value. So functions of propositions have propositions as the argument. The speech acts in which they are involved have thus a propositional code. So there is no relation in which, between the idea that some terms don't contribute a component because they have expressive meaning and the idea that the speech acts in which they, they are put to work don't possess truth conditions. Hmm? In the speech acts in which the following sentences are uttered, it is good that finally the Central European Bank has decided not to continue with the formal politics of austerity, or necessarily the series, uh, the series of natural numbers doesn't have a final element, or uh, Mary has got breaks, uh, cancer, unfortunately, In these three cases, there are terms uh, which don't work as uh, a representation of conceptual components, but nevertheless, these three uh, speech acts in general 
in, the, in this uh, speech act, some propositions are put forward. The propositions that the Central European Bank has decided not to continue with this formal policy of austerity, or uh, the, the second, or the third, that uh, might have got breaks cancer. So, uh, just uh, uh, five minutes. What is the idea? What is the one of the reasons why people think that if you in include a, a term with expressive meaning, the complex uh, doesn't have truth conditions. The idea is, is, is to say it uh, quickly, a bad interpretation of the principle of compositionality. A bad interpretation of the principle of compositionality. The interpretation that I have called the myth of the inevitable gap. And the idea is, if uh, if a term has a, its meaning, a way of contributing a genuine component of the propositional content, if a term has this function, and it fa and it fails, it fails to uh, represent a genuine component, then the process by which the propositional content is built up, blocks, get blocked. And so we don't, we don't end up with a propositional content. So the idea is this one. If I say, uh, so there are uh, two possible ways. For instance, here, she's a student. If we don't put this uh, sentence in, in the context of, of a speech act, and we don't, we don't know which is the, the reference of she, we don't have here a propositional component because we have a gap. Other possibilities that we are using a known word. So in these two cases, the process of building up a propositional content, a content is blocked. So we don't have truth conditions because some of the terms are not representational, okay? So in both cases, the interpretation process can, uh, can be blocked and no available content uh, could be put forward as a result. But this situation has nothing to do with the following. The following situation is the situation in which some uh, non-representational terms, like higher order concepts, are used to indicate the way in which we should understand a propositional content that is previously available. So confusing both kind of processes is what I have called the myth of, of the inheritable gap. Okay? And expressivism or, or the main criticism against expressive proposals about meaning rests on this confusion. The confusion of thinking that if an expression has expressive meaning, there is no proposition uh, put forward. A partial conclusion, a common flow in both sides of the general debate between expressivism in all its brands and realism, on cognitivism and the like, has to do with the myth of the inevitable gap, uh, with the assumption that all representational gaps affect the semantic, the semantic whole in the same way. Okay? So, and that's all. No, okay. <laughs> okay. So my uh, okay. And uh, now, Marcellus, we will have some comments. <coughs> okay. Can you use your computer because mine is going to? It's not my computer. Oh. I forgot that the plugs here are, they do not, they do not work, so I would use this. Which is yours? No, it's, um, it's HP.
the clicker I don't know I have one which is exactly the same this is mine Right, well, um, may I start? So I had some comments, but um, um, I made the comments after reading your uh, chapter uh, four, and it's not exactly the same as what you had just presented now with minimal expressives. Mm -hmm. So my comments were mostly against the uh, formulation you had uh, in the book. But I think, I actually think it's easier with minimal expressives to express my objection. Okay. Um, so I'll just continue with my comments, and then maybe in the end we'll see if it applies and how it applies. And, uh, um, so my first comments were just uh, con congratulatory and um, about the book. It's an impressive uh, um, undertaking, at least. Um, the the main idea is to. Uh, deal away with all the mysteries uh, surrounding or puzzling all the semanticists uh, the philosophies of language uh, uh, that surround the concept of truth. And the main impetus, I think, is to give a deflationary but not a limitarist account of uh, truth, right? So we don't want, um, um, we want to explain what truth is, but not in such a sense, uh, but not a reductionist approach that we have to push it away. Uh, because it might not even, that would probably not be possible, which I think is the correct way to proceed. So these things are great, and are, I think the correct methodology and the great way to proceed. Now, the, the core of the approach is um, a pragmatist or pragmatic approach that centers on truth ascription. This, this is also a, um, a great uh, attribute, a great... Um, feature of the account because it connects the account to contemporary linguistics maybe or to in in any sense what what is um, um, a more scientific uh, uh, approach rather than armchair philosophy and uh, just thinking about propositions without actually seeing what people do with with language and the um, the um, the, the the aim of the book is to give a complete theory of truth, so explain everything that, were, uh, uh, that involves truth, including those paradoxes that those pesky paradoxes that have troubled people since uh, ancient Greece, and people are still writing and writing things about them, like the liar paradox. So um, this is uh, also a great thing. I also think that the liar paradox has something really looks like sophistry, right? It looks uh, like uh, there's something really wrong with uh, how the paradox is. So if we can eliminate it completely, you know, everyone would agree that this was a great thing. Um, I had two general quotes that I put up here, but um, I'm not going to uh, talk a lot about them because uh, I thought that you would talk about them in the, today and tomorrow, and actually you did talk about one of them. One that might 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 appear later on in this in these comments is that um, if the content of type A exhibited truth ascriptions, such as uh, this is this is your term, such as it is true that Victoria does not like Mondays, if the content is just the proposition that Victoria does not like Mondays, then uh, the obvious question is why do you why do we use uh, the truth? concept, right? 
Um, and what I think was also Adriano's point before was uh, is um, what do we use is true the exact um, predicate is true and not some other kind of predicate or some other kind of marker of emphasis. Um, and this is assuming your comments on chapter four that um, truth is more like a marker of emphasis or a way to display the proposition. And this, of course, is a form of all the redundancy objections that, as you said uh, yesterday, were um, uh, usually raised against Ramsey's account, but they're also used against any deflationary accounts of truth. Um, a lot of deflationary, most of the deflationary accounts of truth. It's like, okay, if you deflate the, the, the concept, the meaning, then, then why do you use that one and not something else? And that might come up um, later here in this comment. A second general quote is, um, which you did uh, take care of it today, I think. It's a difference between saying that um, you have a pragmatist view on uh, something and um, uh, saying that you have, uh, and centering your view on a concept, sorry, ex uh, and having a view on a concept that centers on the pragmatics. And uh, the, the obvious difference, can, I mean, one obvious difference can be seen in uh, this quote that uh, I actually stole from Russell, not from William James, exactly. Uh, he thinks that William James thinks this is William James. <laughs> that William Gaines thinks that truth is anything which it pays to believe. And a lot of American pragmatists, uh, at least, assumes this kind of position, right? So it's something related to the personal interest of the, um, um, of the agent. Why you say that, um, I, I think your pragmatist core of the position is something like this, that truth terms and truth ascriptions of type A to the um, only have expressive meaning, which is uh, essentially different, right? And the difference is the utterers of agents exact um, uh, personal interest. How do they enter into truth or don't they? Um, now, I don't know if this is a usual um, a mistake that people make, uh, confusing uh, pragmatist views with pragmatic views. I certainly did it. The first time I was hearing your talk, I was conflating the two, so I'm just flagging it here. And you also said today that it's not the William James approach or what Russell thinks the William James approach is. Right? Um, so these two problems, general qualms, might be not, um, well, um, they might not be very pressing or at least uh, and the way I have phrased them are not that pressing. But I think um, that they involve um, all my objections against a pragmatic account of, um, of meanings. Right? So I try to I try to go back to to do some a bit of historical philosophy of language too. And um, I think my problems with it general pragmatic account of meanings um, are related to the problem that the early Russell faced, uh, faced uh, in his principles of mathematics. I thought it would be a nice way, a nice uh, historical uh, aside to see the problem and then see if your account also falls into the same traps. Mm -hmm. right. So what's the early Russell problem? Well, when I'm... Um, Talking about the early Russell, I'm talking about a very small period of Russell's. Well, um, I don't actually know how, how long he held his views, but at least um, we find his views in 1903, the, the principles of mathematics, and that's not the Principia Mathematica, it's a, it's a different earlier work. And by 1910, uh, he has already um, discarded all his views, so that's like seven years. And actually, even in 1905, he started discarding this view. Um, and his comments in the principles of mathematics um, start by the two, what he thinks are obvious facts, that um, propositions are essentially truth bearers, the bearers of truth and falsity. If you ask me what is a proposition, I will tell you, well, it's the thing that is true or false. Um, 
But also, he says, they are the objects of our propositional attitudes. We now call them propositional attitudes. Before, back then, it was just, oh, propositions are what is believed, or what is asserted, or what is known, right, or what is doubted. Um, so he supports these two views, which, by the way, are held by everyone in that period, I, just, I think. Uh, definitely Frege, and uh, definitely most of contemporary philosophy of language. This is the semantic side. Now, these, these, these views are not the issue. Okay? And um, Russell supports them by saying, well, look at this sentence. It is true that Mont Blanc is over 4,000 meters high. What is true? That's a proposition. Whatever is true, that's a proposition. Right? Or um, here, I believe that Mont Blanc is over 4,000 meters high. What do you believe? Whatever you believe, that's a proposition. That's usually how it goes, the dialectical. The problem is not so. The problem is not that propositions are belong to these two categories or it's general. Generally, that's what they are. The problem is what he identifies in uh, in the principles of mathematics as the metaphysics of the proposition, as the nature of the proposition, what they really are, and what he says is that propositions are what we now call Russellian propositions, even though he never um, called them Russellian propositions, of course, and, uh, and uh, he only held the view for two years, three years, something like that. We now call them Russellian propositions. And they are structured complexes of objects, properties, and or relations between them. Right? Here's the idea. When you say things like Mont Blanc is more than 4,000 meters high, um, the sentence's content is a proposition. And if you believe what is expressed by that sentence, you believe a proposition. And what is the proposition? Well, it's just a complex of Mont Blanc, Mont Blanc and the property being more than 4,000 meters high whatever their property is. And then you have the famous exchange with Frege, which uh, Frege asks, what do you mean the Mont Blanc, um, the mountain with all its peaks and slopes and everything, that's part of the proposition? And, and Russell said, yes, yes, that is part. I mean, we're talking about the object. We're not talking about... Um, um, Sorry, uh, we're not talking about the way you view the object. When we're talking about the proposition, he's, Russell said, right, the earlier Russell, we're talking about the object, Mont Blanc, with all its peaks and all its slopes. <coughs> now, there is a debate on why he said these, these, um, these things. Um, sorry, can I move around or? Yes. Yes? yes. Okay. Um, but it's pretty obvious, I mean, he said that in many cases, that he, he said uh, the main impetus for holding this view is that for him, propositions are objective and mind-independent entities. And the, 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 the motivation is he thinks that um, propositions, qua things that are true, qua truth uh, bearers, do not depend on anyone judging or believing that they are true. They are independent of anyone knowing them. As a matter of fact, he says the only way he can find this independence or objectivity is to point to the world. So his propositions are complexes of worldly entities. They are worldly entities. They are complexes of objects and properties. Or in cases of relation and propositions, such as Basilis loves Mary, then it's a complex of the two objects being related in a way. The main problem he finds with this approach, and I think the most, the, uh, what he calls the most difficult question with this approach, is the following. What do we assert or believe when we be assert or believe a, a false proposition? If we go back to his theory, if, if 
he who goes back to his theory, he's going to say, well, the complex, right? A proposition is a complex of objects and entities and properties, right? So when we believe or assert a false proposition, well, we believe or assert a complex of entities. Take the false proposition that Mont Blanc is less than 4,000 meters high. What is this false proposition that we assert or believe, or that we might assert or we might believe? Well, it's just a complex of Mont Blanc and the property being less than 4,000 meters high. But now we have a problem. And the problem is that there doesn't seem to be such a fact in the world. If there was a fact, a worldly entity consisting of Mont Blanc and the property of being less than 4,000 meters high, if there was in the world, it looks like it would be an objective falsehood. But then there would be no difference between truth and falsity. In both cases, you have a proposition, and then you have a corresponding fact. In the world, right? because we assume that there is such a fact. Right? But now we don't have any way of differentiating truth and falsity. What makes it true that Mont Blanc is actually more than 4,000 meters high and false that it is less than 4,000 meters high? If there is a fact, there was a fact in the other case, too. So we have no way of differentiating truth and falsity. And also, the world does not consist of falsehoods, he says. So, um, I am Greek, right? But also I'm not Portuguese, and I'm not Brazilian, and I'm not Spanish. And it seems weird to say that all of this... Sorry. It, it, it is true that I am Greek, but it's false that I'm Portuguese, it's false that I am Brazilian, it's false that I'm Spanish, etc., etc. It's weird to say that the world consists of all these false facts. So the answer should be, there is no such fact for us, right? But this is, this is a huge problem, because if there is no such fact, there is no proposition. We have identified the proposition with the fact. If we say there is no fact, there is no proposition. So what the hell do we assert or believe? Nothing. And um, we do not assert anything. Here's the problem. If you ask, what do we assert when we assert a false proposition, and you reply, we do not assert anything, it looks like we can only assert true proposition. And that's the big uh, problem with Russell's early theory. He accepts it. He has more problems. He's trying, he actually trying to get around it by uh, using assertion as an act. I don't know if you can, uh, yeah. Um, but then he says, oh, but, but, but um, assertion is not, um, assertion is not, uh, I need logical assertion, uh, but this is, I don't, I don't just need uh, the psychological assertion of saying something. I need something stronger, something like really um, logical, right? A logical notion that will guarantee me something like truth. And that's where he stops and he says, well, I don't know how to explain this. Um, I'm completely lost, so let's try something else. That's all his comments about assertion are, I think, like three lines. Um, um, uh, by the way, I think he means predication. Uh, and Frege, um, when he was talking about assertions, he was using the word behaupten, and I don't think I don't know if behaupten is, uh, involves some kind of logical predicating thing. And that's why everyone was like, so confused. In any case, um, my diagnosis is that the problem arises because Russell packages together the truth side, what has been classically treated as the truth side, and what has been classically been treated as the semantic side, and by that I mean the proposition. He's trying to package them together. Right? In a sense, and he actually says that in another paper in, uh, on the nature of truth, 
In a sense, he is deflationary about truth, too. He's trying to get rid of truth and putting um, the world side, the truth side, in, the, in, the, in what makes the proposition the proposition, right? But that's a problem exactly because you can't explain false propositions. If you package truth inside the proposition, then you have a problem with false propositions. And of course, you don't do that, right? But you might be, you will tell me if that's true, you might be packaging together the other two sides, the pragmatic side with the truth side. And I think that might lead you to a similar trouble. Um, this is how I think of it. Um, this is how I try to stretch and fold your view into the into the Russell problem. Um, I took this from the book. I, uh, I think the one, the, the, um, um, these are Maria's quotes. I think the important one for me that I want to talk about is the third one. Um, truth conditions are the conditions under which a particular content can be asserted. This is something that she hasn't mentioned yet. Um, and I don't know if she, if, uh, if she's still holding it, or um, this is uh, this we have mentioned. So the only semantic function over and above assertion is some emphasis uh, or some other kind of expressive meaning. Um, and w when uh, you s you ascribe truth, when you, you when you say something like uh, a, a type A exhibitive truth ascript ascription. Um, you're asserting a content and at the same time stress your involvement in an act of assertion. Okay, if these are um, still, I mean, if these, thing, if these are part of the view, then um, it looks like truth conditions are very much like assertability conditions. So um, whenever it is fit to say that P, the proposition P is true, it's also fit to, to say that we can assert it in the context and the other way around. Okay. So I try to drive a wedge between these two notions. Um, and I was thinking of many pragmatic considerations. Sorry, pragmatic context. Why did I put consideration? Um, cases, context where it would be permissible for us to assert P, right? Uh, but uh, we, it is independent if, whether P is true or not. So, um, if you are a super, if you are a pragmatist in the William James way, you might think that in cases of survival, when your life depends on it, you are allowed to assert P, uh, irregardless of whether P is true or not. Right, so we don't care about truth in that case. Um, if I don't, I really don't care about truth in that case, right? If it's a matter of survival, I will, I will assert P. Um, you might have uh, certain language games where um, um, <clears throat> what's at stake again is not truth, but it's some kind of maybe in a court or maybe in a, in a rhetoric. Uh, um, sorry, what's that called in the in the U.S. universities where you have like. A, a contest of people doing rhetoric, like arguing for one view and someone arguing for a different view. How is that? Um, well, also law school, yeah. Uh, debating society. The debating thing. Right? It doesn't matter if peace is true or not. What matters is, you know, to persuade. Um, or actually, and that is closer to pragmatics considerations, because this might be totally pragmatist, this is contextualist, this is pragmatics. Uh, in irony, you might want to say that you assert P, but you assert it in an ironic way. <clears throat> right, you're saying, yeah, P. Right? Um, okay. If, if these cases um, are good cases, then it looks like 
truth conditions and assertability conditions um, um, do not and entirely fit together, right? I'm driving a wedge here, I'm picking them apart. So I see two solutions. And one is to thicken the assertability conditions, right? And to reply to me, Vasilis, you're wrong. In none of these cases are you allowed to assert P. Or you might go the thin route, and you might want to say, well, sure, you can, if in these cases you are allowed to assert P, but then you would be uh, asserting, sorry, then you would be um, 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 truth ascribing. This is a bad formulation. Right. And here's my point. If you think in assertability, and in a sense, you make it look a lot like truth, then you have this Russell problem. It looks like you cannot assert false proposition. Why? Because you cannot assert, uh, because exactly the condition is, can you assert it or not? So if you make it, if you make assertability that I can assert P the same as P is true, and it looks like you can never assert false proposition. And that's the Russell problem. Um, it looks like a problem because people often assert false propositions. We do it all the time. Now, if you make it too thin and say that in all these contexts you would be asserting true propositions, what you're losing is this mind independent of the thing that is true. In the, in, the, in the way that Russell put it, there is no way to differentiate between truth and falsity anymore. Um, what was the last one? Oh, well, that's, that's, that's an aside. Um, uh, in a world with no persons or interests or no mind, uh, we lose the distinction between truth and falsity because we lose all the assertability conditions. Yeah, that's it, I think. So, I'm. So it's probably not pragmatic; it's semantic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And you have put your people in very good situation, but yeah. I, have, I think I have answered for all of them. But this, good, good. What, what I mean is that they, they are the, the, let's say, the relevant ones. So thank you for pointing at them. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to explain. I mean, it, it's not difficult, but I would, it would take time to explain. So one of the problems which I, I wanted to, I would like to, uh, to put forward here is that some uh, so, so some of the problems with Russell's uh, position with Russell's position is that people so something that Frege didn't do is that people uh, uh, tend to confuse objectivity with spatiotemporal location and people think so Frege never did uh, never um, never confused these two levels. And uh, Frege said that numbers were objective, but not spatiotemporal, of course, entities, what I mean. So what does it mean to be objective? To be objective means that you cannot invent their properties. And in this sense, propositions are objective. And in this sense, they are mind independent. And it doesn't mean that they are physical construction of any kind. So I think that Russell was completely wrong in this uh, point. No? But about this uh, thick and thin assertability, this is a very interesting point because, curiously enough, truth conditions, the notion of truth condition has nothing to do with the notion of truth, with the meaning of truth. Truth conditions are assertability conditions in the following sense. 
Uh, the truth condition of a sentence uh, such as the cat is on the mat is that, I don't know, whichever conditions that entitle the agent to assert that the cat is on the mat. Assert. Uh, so the, the idea of truthfully is because you are looking for a justification. What I mean is that, for instance, Okay. Yeah, if I assert, if I'm entitled to assert a proposition, for instance, that the cat is on the mat, on the mat, you can say, you can uh, say, but this proposition is false. What you are just just saying is, no, you you are not entitled to assert this proposition. So there is no no paradox here. I mean, the paradox uh, the paradox. Um, this idea, which, which is quite curious, the, the idea that you can't assert a false proposition. Why not? The problem is that the people who assert and the people who qualify it as false cannot be the same people at the same time. Full stop. Nothing else. I would be committing a pragmatic fallacy if I, say, if I were to say, okay, I assert that P, but P is false. But if I say I assert that P, uh, I, the, the same entitlement that allows, that, that allows me to assert P allows me to assert that P is true. But you can have a different opinion from your point of view. And you can see that, that my entitlements are weak. It's okay. There is no problem with this. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm talking from a, a very different perspective from the perspective uh, used by Russell, for instance. And uh, so let's go back and because I would like to answer. Uh, yeah, truth is, truth is not assertability. Truth is not assertability. But truth only comes after a real or virtual assertive act. Because we need an, an, act, an act of assertion in order to have a proposition to which, I, to which we can attribute truth. Okay? There are two different acts. So, nothing to do with Russell's problem, apart from his account of indefinite descriptions. I think that everything else that Russell said is false. Uh, including Principia Mathematica. <laughs> and, uh, okay, this is interesting, and, it, and you are right, but the, 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 the point is that I'm not sure myself uh, where is the distinction between pragmatist and pragmatics. I mean, I can uh, imagine, but sometimes I'm, uh, I, I, have, uh, I have sympathies. Uh, for the for American pragmatists, in the following sense, I think that uh, the pragmatic maxim is very interesting. So there is no diff so it, you can you cannot uh, let's say it, you you cannot uh, uh, defend a different in meaning between two terms if you are not able to point at different situation in which one so one is allowed to use one of them and not the other, for instance. If there is no difference in terms of actions or possibility of, of actions, I, ca I wouldn't say that there is a difference in meaning. So in this sense, I like this uh, uh, pragmatist perspective. But in another sense, I'm, a, I'm using pragmatics as a, as, a kind of a, as a kind of approach to a theory of meaning, which is something different. You are right. Uh, well, uh, I wouldn't say that uh, truth is a marker of emphasis. This is the, the idea that some somebody that most people attribute to Strawson, and I don't say, I, I don't. I mean, I'm not saying that uh, uh, truth, and I, I don't think that Strawson defended that truth is a mark of emphasis. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes, so you can apply this idea of, of a, a, a marker of emphasis to this exhibit through subscriptions, because otherwise, this uh, exhibit through subscriptions are idle. They, they don't seem to perform any particular uh, role. My point was uh, the one I have explained in, in the former uh, session. It's just a pragmatic uh, job, the job of trying to put in front of the audience a particular proposition. The display. Display, exactly, a manner of display. Uh, but uh, the emphasis, the, the notion of emphasis, okay, yes, but uh, I mean, it's the same emphasis that you put in a proposition when you assert it. It's a manner of display. This is, I think, more correct. And another thing is interesting. Deflationary is not one of my terms. I have a, I have tried to avoid the term in these talks and also in my book, because the flashionary has this air of dismissive air. Some, the, the idea in uh, uh, the flashionary uh, means that uh, the theory of truth should have some other properties uh, that it has not. And sometimes I uh, make fun saying that the other the other kinds of theory of truth are inflationary, okay? And this is why yesterday I said that uh, that uh, a theory of truth has precise limits. So what I'm trying to do is not saying everything that one can say about truth, but everything that one can say about the meaning of truth, the meaning of the notion. So in this in this sense, I don't think that my that my position is deflationary, because you don't need to put anything else to account for the meaning of truth. Okay, and if you put, for instance, your favorite metaphysical position, then you are inflating the theory. I'm not deflating it. Okay, so this is why <laughs> I'm not using. It. Uh, and a complete theory of truth. The point is a complete theory of the way in which the notion of truth works in natural languages. So I, I think, I mean, I might, be to, I, I might be wrong, but what I have tried to do is to offer a complete characterization of the meaning of truth, but not a com- ah, of the meaning, the meaning of truth, not a complete characterization of everything you can do uh, with the notion of truth. Okay? So in this sense, uh, okay, you are right. And- and okay, but thank you very much. I mean, <laughs> it has been very interesting. I don't know if I have answered your forms or not. Or yeah, yeah, most of them. Most of them. So thank you very much. So, okay. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. So because we are out of time this afternoon, we must stop. I don't know if you have a very urgent question. Urgent? I don't think. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>